I'll tell you what I tell parents when they ask me, you know, are you concerned about letting them have freedom with screens? No, I'm not in this environment. And right, here's right. why I, here's <laughs> what, how I tell it to parents. There is a huge difference between the child who is uptight, scared, depressed, you know, having all the frozen because they're so afraid of the teacher, having mm -hmm. ashamed, having all those negative feelings in the school, then running home, turning on video games and getting right into it. That child might be at risk of addiction. That child is using it. You know, in the early drug culture, we use the term fix. The drugs were mm -hmm. a fix. That child might be using video games, social media as a fix to fix mm -hmm. those feelings because he or she doesn't know how to deal with those feelings because they're not acknowledged at traditional school. Right, right. Very, very different process from kids in Sudbury schools. And right, interestingly right. that you bring up the thinking, because I heard a very similar conversation to the catastrophic thinking issue with a couple of boys when about a month ago, they're playing a video game and he's like, yeah, but he's reacting. You know, he's like, there's only one way. There are a hundred ways. And it was, you know, they get that because mm -hmm. they use social media and video games very differently. They use them socially. They interact socially. They're not using them to suppress negative feelings because they deal with those feelings and then they use them as fun, which is a very right. different process, a totally different experience than the kid who runs home and has to get on. So I have a hard time with these people who are researching social media per se because they're not right acknowledging how or where or why it's being used. And to exactly. me, what I have seen over the years in Sudbury schools, that's vitally important. I can honestly say I have not seen a kid that I would call addicted to social media or uh, gaming in a Sudbury school. And I have exactly. co-founded three and you know, oh, been staff yeah. for 15 years here and for several years in Florida and haven't seen it. So yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I hear that, but my concern is that with everything that the education system does, they're always, ex so they're blaming something else. Remember, it's always right. the kid, it's not the school. That's it's right. always right. the social media. It's not the school. It's all it's it's always that process, not our process. We're the educators and there are some wonderful educators. We all know that, but they're in a system that requires them to live like this. Right. It requires right. it. So unless we totally transform that system, it will continue to have the dysfunctional, hurtful, problematic emotions experienced by 99% of the people who've come through it. Right. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I'm here with Jerry Quirk of Jersey Shore Free School, um, a Sudbury school. Um, and welcome, Jer uh, Jerry. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you. All right. 
Um, so I like to start off with uh, storytelling. So um, tell us a story about somebody who really got great value out of what the school has to offer, really came in and took advantage and, and, and made it work for them. I'll tell you the story of our first graduate who went all the way through 12 years of Sudbury education. Wow. And I have her permission to tell her story. I also <laughs> have her permission for other things, which I'll let you know. Her name is Jamie. And I vividly remember my first meeting with her mom because she was concerned that Jamie was eating too much candy as a little girl. And I, I was telling the story at a library event where I was presenting the school to people we were just starting. This is 15, 16 years ago. I was talking about the, I'm a psychotherapist licensed in several states and I was telling her about that I have real concerns. I'm very interested in systems and that I really mm -hmm. felt that the school system has many systemic problems and very comparable to the same systemic problems that we see in families of addiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, the mom said to me, oh my goodness, I'm so afraid my daughter's, you know, really having a hard time with candy and sweets. And I said, well, you know, part of the reason I started this is I saw Sudbury as such a healthy system. Mm. And, you know, the, the rules of the traditional addictive system are don't feel, don't tell, don't trust. And the opposite happens in Sudbury schools, you know, People mm. learn to talk about feelings, they learn to trust, and they learn to tell the truth because it's a non-judgmental system. They don't feel mm. shamed or afraid to speak their truth. And so anyway, she right away, the mother enrolled both of her children. Jamie will tell you, as she told everybody for years now, she played her entire childhood. She mm -hmm. came to Sudbury, she got it right away, I'm free, I can play, and, and she did that for years and years. At one point she decided she always wanted to fly, and she and I very strongly related in that way, because I always wanted to fly. Not with mm. apparatus, but just fly. But she decided that her first step would be with some sort of apparatus and see how that felt. So she spent a good several months getting money from school meeting to buy she bought that plumber piping stuff and she created mm. wings and <laughs> strapped it onto herself and created a flying machine mm. and you know made a game of it with the kids but she went through the whole process of figuring out what apparatus she would need how much it would cost where she would purchase it and she went through the school meeting, getting permission to do this and, and getting funding that she needed. Mm -hmm. Long story short, Jamie never intended to go to college. She just loved her life and she wanted to keep playing and doing things that were fun for her. But by the time she was about 16, she said, you know, I think oh, now she, this, uh, until 16, she had never had a class in her life. She was reading, mm -hmm. writing, extremely bright, could hold conversations on many topics, but did not in any way take any class that was offered or want any class. But when she was about 16 and a half, it would have been middle of her junior year, what would have been her junior year if she were in a traditional system. She decided she'd take a college class to see what college was like. So she took a writing mm -hmm. class because she always enjoyed writing. She wrote little stories as a little girl, she, you know, just everything play related stories. And she loved the class and she loved the college environment. And she did it as a dual enrollment student. She was at our school but she could go one day a week to the college and take her class and work on her papers. And then she took a philosophy class and she loved <laughs> philosophy because she loved philosophy and psychology because she was always 
talking with other kids about her theories about life and living and why she liked Sudbury so much. And long story short, by the time she finished the following year, which would have been a year and a half of taking classes, I think she took four classes at the community college. She decided she was going to go to college and kind of late in terms of when people usually apply to college. But she wrote a paper, I'm guessing it was about 34 typed pages wow. about her learning experiences in a Sudbury school. And she sent it to four colleges that she thought she wanted to go to, Eckerd in Florida, Muhlenberg where her parents had gone, Brown wow. University in Rhode Island, and I'm forgetting the fourth one, but three of the four gave her academic scholarships over $100,000 each based mm. on this paper that she wrote talking about how she felt like she had learned so many skills that her peers did not have. Clearly, she had a voice that was loud and strong for an 18-year-old young woman. And the colleges saw it and, as I said, gave her major scholarship money, academic scholarships. Cool. She had no transcript because Sudbury schools don't require coursework. It's right. all self-directed right. learning. Right on. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were to, to be describing the Sudbury model to kind of the random person on the street, how do you how do you go about describing it and helping them understand it? I'm happy to answer that. I just want to go back. I forgot to say that Jamie has told me like two years ago that I have permission to send her paper to anyone that would like to read what she wrote to the colleges. So if I anybody like wants to contact me at the Jersey Shore Free School, I will send it because it gives you such a wonderful feeling of how different an education she received, but the competence level that she achieved. And it's yeah, really yeah. very well done. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, first of all, I want one. Okay. I'm happy to send you <laughs> one, definitely. And she may be a wonderful interview for you to do down the road. She is yeah, very yeah. articulate and would be happy to do mm -hmm. it. Cool. cool. Um, so if I'm seeing somebody on the street and they ask me about Sudbury education, I tell them that it is self-directed learning, that students have great freedom to pursue whatever interests them. However, what primarily interests most young people is play and relationships and activities that are carried out with their friends and that while there's often a leader in one activity, it switches with the other activity because it's right. dependent on the person who has more skills in that particular activity, whether it be a soccer game or a walk in the woods and you know somebody knows a lot about nature. And it's really fascinating how that happens. Beyond that, the environment in my perspective, as I said, as a psychotherapist, it's not meant to be in any way, shape or form a therapeutic school. However, right. I have seen kids be able to get out of therapy very quickly because the environment mm. is so healing and so emotionally safe and psychologically safe for kids that it works, though not meant to be therapeutic, it works therapeutically. Right, and, right. You know, works to give all kids that sense of, of safety and really independence and autonomy that most young people crave that they don't get right. in most other places. You mentioned that you look at systems. And so how would you characterize the system of Sudbury like a lot of people think that schools tend to be run by a charismatic 
figure who is going to, you know, create that environment. But we, as people familiar with (laughs) with how human minds actually work, realize that that while there may be some charisma on the part of the leader, it doesn't work unless there's a system to support the whole thing. How would you describe Sudbury as a system for psychological safety? Well, first of all, one of the things I always say to the students in school meeting, which is the body that runs the school, I, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I tell new students the the school meeting is like the principal of a traditional school and school meeting as a unit works together to accomplish everything that needs to be done in the school. In Mm -hmm. school meeting, every person has a voice. It's run like the New England town meeting, the old town Mm -hmm. meeting, where it's one vote to each person. Students get, they can count. There are way more students (laughs) than staff. And one Mm -hmm. vote to each person automatically makes them feel quite safe and quite willing to speak up because they know their voice matters. We do. We don't do the clerk of school meeting the way traditional Sudbury schools do. We use the Native American talking stick, which is one little tweak we've added because the kids liked it better. That means whoever has the talking stick decides who speaks next. They look around the circle and they see who has their hand up. And I might have mine up, but I don't necessarily get the talking stick. That is very empowering for young people. They see that often, you know, the four-year-old will get the talking stick. And we have a rule in our school meeting that people under eight may speak to any issue they want. They don't have to speak to the current agenda item because our little Mm -hmm. ones often tell us what they had for dinner last night. But they grow up learning to speak in community and and not being afraid, Mm. you know, as a former speech and English teacher. I love it (laughs) that they are comfortable to speak in a group very young and that carries on through their whole childhood. Mm -hmm. But that circle sets the parameters of the school. And those are the safe boundaries. We're, we're governed in our school by two primary rules, safety and respect. Mm. And school meeting sets those boundaries. All the rules that they make in school meeting are weighed against safety or respect. Safety mm-hmm. for myself, for the other, for the environment, for the building. Respect to ourselves, respect for the other respect for the environment, respect for the building, etc. Mm. And children feel very safe and comfortable when they know that those boundaries are upheld. And it's the mm. job of the judicial committee, which is one adult, one older student, one younger student, and that rotates mm. every three weeks in our school, who gets to serve on the judicial committee. Their job is to uphold those rules. So Mm -hmm. anyone may write anyone up to the judicial committee for a violation of rules. We're lucky our behavior is quite good in our school. That takes some doing over time. Right. But they write up a rule infraction like about three or four years ago, I got written up for leaving my lunch Mm -hmm. out on the table and I had to go Mm -hmm. to judicial committee and explain that I took a phone call and it was an extended Mm. phone call. I didn't know it would be that long. And I was in the office. And by the time I came back out to finish my lunch, somebody had written me up. And so I was excused by judicial committee. But the fact that a student felt that they could write me up and bring that to JC was very important for the kids. Right. And believe me, everybody in the school knew it. And that was (laughs) <laughs> because, you know, I remember telling Jack, one of our older boys, the day that you can tell me no is the day you will graduate because he was very <laughs> willing to, you know, just do whatever. And I, you know, you, you have as a student in the school as much right for what you want and how you want to do it as I have for it. And that's really important in 
setting that emotionally safe environment. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is, um, speaking of systems, if I could, let me show you yeah. how I originally got into this. Please. In the late 80s, I had read Brianne Eisler's book, The Chalice and the Blade, and she mm -hmm. talks basically about two systemic models of society, what she calls the dominator model and the partnership model. And I was explaining it to a group of ninth grade boys and girls in a traditional public high school and English class. And I'm telling them that this is one of the systems that I'm going to demonstrate to you with stick figures because I can't draw very well. And I showed them this drawing. I just put this on the board. And I said, guys, think about this. Don't answer from your head. Answer from your heart. And tell me from your heart, what does it feel like to be this person? in that relationship hmm. really tell me how it feels and they told me and then as time would allow over the next several years i gave the same talk to many 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 different groups of people from young people to business people to adults to parent teacher organizations and I have a file full probably of a thousand words at this point that I got when I said, how does it feel to be that person in that relationship? Mm. And here is a sampling of many words that I got. Mm -hmm. And when I said to the kids and to many other people, where do you experience that? School, home, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, church, uh, sports, business, from my boss. Mm -hmm. Basically, it is the culture most of us have learned. It's the systemic way of living that we've learned. And I want you to pay attention here. I'm not good at reading backwards. I'm going to point out a couple <laughs> of things here and here. These are words from adults and kids and everybody else. Mm. We're currently concerned in the broader world of education with the overwhelming anxiety and depression that we are seeing in young people. It is being blamed on COVID, and I guess, in a way, all these people that I've interviewed for years and years and years are blaming it on the system. Because if the system operates like that, and this is how people feel, which is emotionally unsafe, mm -hmm. with a variety of different hurtful feelings, we need to take a different look at the system. And I love Rian Eisler because I believe she's written so much in this regard, though I'm not quite sure she gets it in terms of education because she was educated right. this way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but she helped me change as a teacher. And mm. When I started talking to ninth grade kids, who, by the way, nobody in the world is more honest if you give them the freedom to be the ninth grade kids. And so I said to them, the other system that she describes in her book, she calls a partnership system. And it looks more like this. Mm -hmm. So tell me from your heart, how does it feel to be this person? in that system and that relationship. And where do you experience that? And very few had experienced it. Right. And except primarily with their friends was what the kids would say. Some adults, when I speak to groups of adults, experience it with their partners. Many do not. Mm. Right. Some experience it with colleagues at work. Many do not. 
-hmm. And almost no one experienced it in school. I've heard a couple of stories of caring teachers, one-on-one -on -one conversations, but then when I say to the person, was it like that in the classroom? No, it was not. And because teachers are required, the number one thing that teachers are evaluated on is, quote, controlling their class in the traditional right, right. system. So they are almost required to be like that. But when I asked, how does this feel? Mm -hmm. This is what I got. I'm talking about thousands of answers over 30 years now, every time I give mm -hmm. this talk. Well, look at this list. Which group of people is more capable of learning easily? The disempowered group or the empowered group? The disrespected group or the respected group? The sad, scared, and lonely people or the happy, safe, and involved people? And over all these years, as I've talked about it, and of course I do this for every new student coming into our school, and I say, you're going from a school where you lived like this to a school where you're going to live like this, and it's going to take you a while to really feel that. Mm. But anytime you don't feel it, call me on it, or come and tell me if you're mm. feeling it, because our school is committed to this. I believe all Sudbury schools operate like this if they're truly functional Sudbury schools. And I believe it's a much healthier environment holistically for children to grow up. It's my experience that kids who live like that and also live like that at home, because many of our parents put these stick figures on their refrigerator. And I tell them, <laughs> you have to be willing to give up the power to become a more empowered family and mm -hmm. allow your children to call you on it the way I allow them to call me on it at school, the way I want them to call me on it. Because mm -hmm. I tell them, mm -hmm. I want to live like this in relationship, where we respect each other and where we learn together. Mm -hmm. My experience is, and you know, Danny Greenberg wrote a lot about this, my idol Danny Greenberg, who was one of the prime founders of the whole Sudbury movement, wrote mm -hmm. a lot about how when he would teach math to kids when they finally really wanted to learn math, he could teach the entire elementary school curriculum in 20 hours where they totally got it. Because I believe the system creates emotionally safe, respected, empowered, happy children, happy people can learn anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> why do you think it takes so long to teach that math curriculum that he can teach in 20 hours, why does it take a thousand hours in traditionals? Because the kids don't want to learn it when they're teaching it. That's and right. we don't believe that they're capable of deciding when they want to learn it. And that mm -hmm. is part of this disempowering belief system. As I've talked to lots of people, and lots of kids about this, I have come to believe, as they do, that there is a continuum. At the far mm. end of the continuum is just very gentle things like, oh, little Johnny, let me tie your shoe for you because we're in a hurry and I want to get out. Whereas Johnny feels good about himself when he ties his shoes. And for heaven's sakes, mom or teacher, you can wait three minutes and I had to learn that. I can wait mm -hmm. while Johnny ties his shoes because that's so empowering. And so the subtle ways that we do this to children are have been a big topic of discussion the last few years with our group and parents, all mm -hmm. the way to the very domineering ways that we do it and autocratic ways that we do it in traditional schooling. Um, I did want to go back to this list because mm. these are these are words that I 
got from so many people that I just pulled out. But I want to note this ashamed. Mm. We know, those who don't follow um, Ms. Brown on, on social media, we all know as therapists that shame is at the root of so many mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And shaming children is almost built into the way we do schooling. And mm -hmm. it, is, it is just so sad to me that there's such an easier way to do it. And because the adults are so schooled, they're really mm -hmm. afraid to let their children come into a self-directed learning environment where they have freedom to choose for themselves. We hold mm -hmm. parent meetings based around the stick figures and really challenge parents to live the way we do at school. Obviously, we can't require it, but right. what we have shown so many parents and we get you know the older parents to come back and tell them, so glad I listened because it made our parenting so much easier. It mm -hmm. made our home life so much happier. We saw siblings who were fighting begin to learn to talk to each other about feelings and understand each other rather than fight it out. Mm -hmm. And many parents have shared that it really helped their personal adult relationship to mm -hmm. learn to live like this. So we continue to hopefully educate the parents as we're educating the children. Although Jamie, the girl I told you the story about, her mom always tells me, Jerry, keep remembering to tell them it's much easier to be a Sudbury student than a Sudbury parent. <laughs> parent does have to trust that the child right. can do it. Mm -hmm. But I have watched this for 35 years and I'm telling every parent, no matter what you believe, your child can do it and they will do it happily. And they will, if they want to, they will get into college with no grades, no transcript, nothing we were told they have to have by a system mm -hmm. that wants to give them that by a system that has decided for them rather than asking them, by a system that pushes their agenda rather than allowing the child to find his or her own agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And parents, once they hear it's gonna be easier parenting, the ears perk up a bit. And once they see it beginning to work, they're willing to learn more in my experience. Mm -hmm. But one of the mm -hmm. things that I really make clear to them, um, you know, all my years of experience as a therapist have really helped me tell this in a very honest way that parents get. And that mm -hmm. is the current traditional way that we school children is a system that causes young people to become externally referented. By that, I mean that they come to believe by living in that system that all of their answers are out here because the adults know best, the school system knows best for you, this teacher knows best for you, this curriculum knows best for you rather than allowing children the time and space that they need to listen mm. in here, to become internally referented with the choices they make for their learning and their life, which is mm. the much healthier way to live and really not allowed much in the traditional schooling system because mm. the curriculum is the boss. And right, the right. curriculum doesn't often work for somebody who's internally referented. So we have to get them to believe that mm. someone out here has the right way or the right answers for them. But what that does to them over time 
is extremely harmful in my belief system because having worked so much with addictions and with domestic violence, it causes people to become so externally referenced that when they hit a hard time in their teenage years or their adult life, they look for something out here to make it better. Mm. They go to alcohol, sex, drugs, shopping, whatever, and often become addicted because they believe that will soothe the angst or depression or whatever they're feeling in here. People who grow up in the Sudbury model, by and large, what I have seen over so many years, become internally referenced. When they hit hard times, they talk about their feelings. They share Mm. with someone they trust. They um, look for the help and, and are comfortable to ask for the help that they need because academically they were always able to ask for what they needed in school, not forced to take what was given. Mm -hmm. So that internal knowing of who they are, you know, I tell stories about, I've worked with 80 year old, 80 odd year old men and women in therapy who still don't know who they are, what Mm -hmm. they wanted in life or why they were even here. It is so sad. It's joyful once they finally get it. And believe me, they are the strongest proponents of a new order and a new system and a new way because they realize how long they lived the other way. But Mm. most of our parents are willing to hear. It's a matter of getting them there to hear. I I would love to do workshops helping adults to understand how schooled they are and how Mm, the mm. fact that they bought into that so strongly is harming their children even more because if i am right if it's an addictive system addictive systems are progressive meaning they get worse and worse so Mm. what parents experienced is about here what kids are experiencing is definitely worse and Mm. that's what the kids tell me when I hear stories mm-hmm. of, of like third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh graders coming from traditional schools now, it's worse than what I experienced for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, the, the, there's Jonathan Haidt is a psychologist out of, uh, I forget what school, he's on the East Coast somewhere, one of the big Ivy Leagues, I think. But anyway, he has a whole project that he's been really focused on the mental health issues in schools. He's part, he was one of the founding group, I don't know if you've heard of the Let Grow, which is Lenore Skenazi, Peter Gray, Jonathan Haidt, and I think Peter Gray is another uh, hero of mine, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So Haidt, I think he actually has a new book coming out soon, but he, um, he's really focused on that and has been documenting sort of the deterioration of mental health across, uh, transnationally, so, so across the world in systems of, of, of all kinds, well, at school systems back. in particular, because that's where most of the adolescents are, mm-hmm. you know, that's where the kids are. Mm-hmm. But, but he's really been careful to, 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 what he's teasing out is his hypothesis, uh, he, he wrote a book a while back with uh, Greg Lukanioff, the, the, how, what is it called, the, something about the coddled mind of America or something like that. And, and basically he's arguing, they are arguing that Social media has had a very specific influence on adolescent mental health because it compounds kind of some of the messaging that is consistent with 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 poor mental health. So worst first thinking, black and white thinking, catastrophic thinking, you know, thinking that, you know, one, either I'm good or I'm bad or whatever situation I'm in is going to be the worst possible scenario. There's, you know, there's no possibility. That's catastrophic thinking, you know, black and white. So, so it takes all those things and, and puts them on a, on a, you know, reinforces them as opposed to a healthy system would have messages around, you know, it's not black or white, you know, yes, you may have done something that hurt someone else, but that doesn't make you a bad person. That means you made a mistake. And then you can do something to change that. 
or or whatever situation you're in, it will change. <laughs> you know, it it and and if you if you work at it, you can make it a ch better change. You know, that's counter to the catastrophic thinking. So so, the challenge is to really, what his his work has been has really been focused on on social media as mm. as a you know everybody recognizes it's a form of echo chamber, but he's really doing the the detailed hardcore academic work to say no this really is caused by social media it really is you know how do he, he i don't know if he had, had makes a causal argument um, i would argue from the per perspective of self-determination theory that it's it's contributing factor but it's really the the undermining of autonomy competence and relatedness that is causing the problem and uh, social media happens to make it worse I'll tell you what I tell parents when they ask me, you know, are you concerned about letting them have freedom with screens? No, I'm not in this environment. And right, here's right. why I <laughs> here's what, how I tell it to parents. There is a huge difference between the child who is uptight, scared, depressed, you know, having all the frozen because they're so afraid of the teacher having ashamed, having all those negative feelings in the school, then running home, turning on video games and getting right into it, that child might be at risk of addiction. That child is using it. You know, in the early drug culture, we use the term fix. The drugs were mm -hmm. a fix. That child might be using video games, social media as a fix to fix mm -hmm. those feelings because he or she doesn't know how to deal with those feelings because they're not acknowledged at traditional school. Right, right. Very, very different process from kids in Sudbury schools. And right, interestingly right. that you bring up the thinking because I heard a very similar conversation to the catastrophic thinking issue with a couple of boys when about a month ago, they're playing a video game and he's like, yeah, but he's reacting. You know, he's like, there's only one way. There are a hundred ways. And it was, you know, they get that because mm -hmm. they use social media and video games very differently. They use them socially. They interact socially. They're not using them to suppress negative feelings because they deal with those feelings and then they use them as fun which is a very right. different process, a totally different experience than the kid who runs home and has to get on. So I have a hard time with these people who are researching social media per se because they're not right. acknowledging how or where or why it's being used. And to exactly. me, what I have seen over the years in Sudbury schools, that's vitally important. I can honestly say I have not seen a kid that I would call addicted to social media or uh, gaming in a Sudbury school. And I have exactly. co-founded three and you know, well, three. been staff yeah. for 15 years here and for several years in Florida and haven't seen it. So yeah. Yeah. I'm... I, I hear that, but my concern is that with everything that the education system does, they're always, ex so they're blaming something else. Remember, it's always right. the kid, it's not the school. That's it's right. always right. the social media, it's not the school. It's, all, it's, it's always that process, not our process. We're the educators. And there are some wonderful educators, we all know that, but they're in a system that requires them to live like this. Right. It requires right. it. So unless we totally transform that system, it will continue to have the dysfunctional, hurtful, problematic, emotions experienced by 99% of the people who've come through it. Right, right. Yeah, and that, that's, um, you know, when you talking about a fix is that there's this great book by Scott Rigby and 
Rich Ryan, I think. Yeah, Richard Ryan, called Glued to Games. It's an older book. What's the name the of the book again? Glued to Games. Richard Ryan was one of the co-founders of self-determination theory, and Scott Rigby was somebody who kind of was it was in that generation of people who grew up playing games. He played a lot of video games, but he basically did a, a bunch of research to really clarify that for that that the video game context is one where if you support the needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness, those are the central, uh, you know, primary human needs that self-determination too. theory puts up. Yeah. Hopefully that's uh, what we want for our children. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But once you provide supports for those things, then the appearance of addiction goes away. And so what he's, what he, this is, you know, the basis of what I was just saying is that, is that when you recognize that the primary human needs, these are psychological needs that are just as important as air, water, food, sleep, and shelter, is when you support those needs, then then a, addiction's not a thing because what the fix was, what, and, and if you think about games or, or social media in mm -hmm. particular, nobody there is telling you what to do. Nobody there is, is imposing on you. You get to have the freedom, the, the autonomy, the, you can seek out, and that's a, a lot of what it is, is the relatedness, is, is most, the most popular games in the world are not, the sh not inherently just shoot 'em ups it's this, the games where people can interact with other people. Um, and so relatedness is key to, to how m the most popular games work. And, and then the whole point of, of designing a game is to enhance competence. Now, it may be a narrow form of competence because <laughs> uh, you're pushing buttons. But, but actually, even the most popular games are ones that challenge you mentally, that, that create complicated scenarios, that, that compl complexify your ability to achieve any particular goal. And the s by far most popular games are the ones that don't inherently specify a goal. You can pursue any goal you want in that game. <laughs> you know, things like Minecraft and things like that. It's like, there is no inherent goal. There's not even a, you, you build the world, and so you create your own goals. My grandson, so when, you when really he was get four that, years old, my grandson built me a house with a swimming pool as my Mother's Day present. Four years old, on Minecraft or Roblox <laughs> or one of them, as a gift. Right, right. And he was so excited and so proud of himself. Yeah. There's so many positive things with with uh, social media and gaming that I'm really concerned with people that are trying to like totally make it the the boogeyman, the bad guy. You know, right. let's get rid of the no, no, no. There's a lot of research that it's created new synapses in the brains of children who are using a lot of gaming that we've never seen mm -hmm. before in human history. And right, right. We need to look at the context in which they're doing it rather than the gaming or the, and I think we're right. on the same page there. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's one of the things that when, whenever I, um, so I taught a class in psychology at, at Village Free School for a year. So when I, you know, realized that I was going to teach that, I was like, okay, what, what, what do I need to, you know, put together for this? And and the central there there one of the central lessons that all of psychology is about is that situations are far more powerful than we than we intuitively think they are, is we think we have you know a stable personality and that personality is is consistent across situations and that the personality is is the, is the only thing that determines my behavior and it's like no, <laughs> you you the situation determines your behavior you have an influence. It's not that personality doesn't matter. Personality does matter. But situations are far more powerful than we can, than, than any intuition we're ever going to get until we've trained ourselves to recognize situational factors and to realize that, like you say, the context of a Sudbury school and what I call agentic schools more broadly is one where there's a fundamentally different context. And so everyone shows up differently in that context. And it's a context that is about being open, having the system being open to being changed by the people in it. And that's one of the things that is most powerful about it. And that's why I focus on agency. That's the power of community. Exactly. And there 
is community when there's freedom. There's not community when there's dictatorship and autocracy. And, you know, it's <laughs> so and, and, kids and get that is, even more than adults sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what it says is even, you know, skillful teachers are trying oftentimes to to provide a version of that from within the system they're in. And so they're trying to create a protected little environment where they can, you know, share some some power, but but then they run up against roadblocks and, and you know and pressures to do to accomplish certain things or to cover certain material or you know and so that's where the system then impinges even on a well-meaning teacher's classroom is that that they're still in a context in which they have limitations on how much freedom they can give how much empowerment they can actually accomplish. I tried to do it for 15 years in high school classrooms <laughs> to create community yeah, in the yeah. classroom. I let kids, you know, bring complaints about me and we'd mediate in the classroom. Yeah. However, it, it was, and I also refused any nominations ever for teacher of the year. I don't like the hierarchy. Mm. Why single out one person when we have a whole community of people who are doing wonderful things? You know, that's all part right. of that system that's not mm -hmm. good. But what I was going to say is that I came to realize that by doing that, I was mm. enabling a very dysfunctional system and I could not stay any longer. Yeah. And and that's one of the things, you know, my work is aimed at, at broadening the conversation about agentic schools. I mean, that's why I have the program, right? And and one of the challenges I find is that is that people one of the ways our brain is wired is to justify the system of which we are a part. It doesn't matter what it is. Once we're in the system, we want the system to we have a sensibility about the system and its its existence. Just in the same way that we always have our own self-concept and that, that our existence is, I mean, assuming you're not in complete depression, but, um, you know, w when we're healthy, we have a sense of ourselves, but we also inherently have a sense of the system of which we're part. And so there's this thing called system justification that that we are always justifying the system. So when it's hard when, when we come and, and say, we've got this thing that works really great and that system doesn't work. And so people in part of that system, one of the challenges is, if they're in the system and, they're, and, and we know that they're subject to system justification by nature, then, then one of the challenges we have is like, how do we help them understand their situation without rejecting our input, you know, without rejecting it outright? And so that's one of the challenges that I see is, is well, how to sort of- That's really interesting. That. Getting back to the stick figures, not everyone becomes system justified, as you're calling it, um, because there are people who get angry, who rebel, right, right. who say this is awful, get me out of here, whatever, both in right, school right. and in organizations and in our country. Oh, yeah, yeah. And one of the points that I make in terms of kids in schooling is those are the healthier kids. In mm. my opinion, it is a mm. much healthier response to say, I hate this, get me out of here. Right, and to right, become right. the little kid who takes the pat on the head from the teacher and becomes set up for victimization of some sort right. because they become submissive to authority rather than ever question authority. They become, mm -hmm. they search out getting that approval for doing what this autocratic boss wants them to do. And they are much more at risk for victimization in their lives. And I have a real concern about that because 90% of kids in every classroom are being set up for victimization. Only 10% become the angry, get me out of here kid because they're told they're the bad ones. <laughs> and everybody in the classroom comes to believe that bad kid. And mm -hmm. that is such a dysfunctional way of right. dealing with people's reaction to a system.
If a system right. is healthy and thriving and joyful and what life is supposed to be, people don't get angry and rebel. There is no such mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. They want to be there. Right. They love it. Right. When somebody yeah, is rebelling, we need to say why, not label them right, as a right. bad person. But I'm right. my concern is for the people who become system justified because they are really slowly but surely being set up for victimization possibly and that's a real concern and, and that's what i mean is that our barbarian is wired to justify the system and what we're what we're aiming at is that they understand a larger system so they recognize that school is a system that's confined and it's it operates in a certain way then they recognize there's a different way to be is you know, that's the that's the kind of step towards enlightenment that we want is is as long as, so I guess what I'm saying is that that our how we approach people in the mainstream system is we want to approach them in a way that leads them towards the sort of realizing the systems bigger than their school and doing it in a way that that bridges that gap rather than reinforces their defense of the system is because once I, they realize I a have, bigger system is possible I have there was a time that I believed that. Let me start there. Okay. <laughs> and I don't anymore. Mm. Because to me, that is one of the subtle, benevolent ways of doing this. Mm. And what I mean by that is, I am more than willing to share everything I've seen that's so positive in Sudbury mm -hmm. schools and in giving children freedom and autonomy and agency over their own lives as well as their own education. Mm -hmm. I'll share, you know, anytime, day or night, I'll, and I do it for free. I never charge for anything. I'll give a talk anywhere. But I won't, I don't want to spend any of my time having an agenda for the system or having mm. an agenda for anyone else. Mm. Because to me, that's part of that. You know, I, w I was a kid who just wanted to make the world a better place. But I realized mm. what I need to do is keep making my world a better place. That's right. my inner wisdom telling me that. And that every time I try to do for them what mm -hmm. they're capable of doing for themselves, having an aha moment when they hear something, having getting um, access to first their own discomfort in the system, because unless they're willing to admit that, they're not going to go looking for something else. Right. Do you get what I'm saying? Like oh, the absolutely. kids call this the done to. Method. Done to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nobody likes to be done to. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Right. And the more I got that, the more I understood. That's why I left the traditional system years ago. I was trying to get them to change. And it's, whoa, right. wait a minute, they're, they're fine where they are. I'm the one that wants to change. I need out of here <laughs> right. so I can right. change. And that's been a progressive theme in my life mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. have no agenda for where anyone else needs to be. I will mm -hmm. tell you that I see the school system as a highly dysfunctional system. And, right. but I wish them well. If that's working for some people right now, I don't think, I think they're in denial, which is part right. of right. the addictive system. I will say that publicly. I worked in a prison as a therapist for a number of years. Mm -hmm. I was way more emotionally comfortable there than I am in most high schools. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. it's a, a more enjoyable environment. Mm. That's very sad. You walk right. down, every classroom looks like this in most high schools. They're bored. At the time, they should be most alive. I'll say what I see. I'll say my mm -hmm. truth. I'll say what I've experienced. 
but I don't want to have any agenda about trying to um, convince or or fix mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. a sick system till it wants to right, fix right. itself, and then I'll help in right. whatever way. Right. Well, you'll notice I'm talking to you. I'm not trying to go preach to them. Right. Right. That's why I love your podcast. You're, no, what do you call this? A video podcast? Podcast, yes. A vlog? Yes. Uh, yes. So I get it. So, so this is the contradiction of holding holding the space is how to share share out and give them a you know give them the opportunity because mm -hmm. and the way I do that is through online distribution. That's and I um, love this because you're doing it. If they right, want right, to exactly. search, they will find you. Exactly. Exactly. So, the, so that's what I what I've realized is that the agenda is not an agenda specifying what they should do or shouldn't do. The agenda is how do we share this more broadly? How do we how do we give our experience, voice, and 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 exposure in the sense of invitation, invitation to a different way of being, a different way of doing school. Now, I'm not going to dictate what that looks like, and that's why I use the term agentic schools, is it's not Sudbury, it's not Acton Academies, or it's not Montessori, it's not Waldorf, it's not, you know, you could, I, can, I can list off a lot of different ways that people do it. The question is, is once you get the bug to do something different, what opportunity do you have? What opportunity do you have to do it differently, to, to take wherever you are and 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 understand the psychological principles. This is this is my uh, communicative agenda. Is like there's psych there's a way that our brains are wired that has to do with autonomy, competence, and relatedness. That's my focus. And how do you bring that to whatever situation you're in? Once you once you have that insight, then okay, how do you do that? Well, you've done it <laughs> through Sudbury, and that's that's fantastic, and I I applaud that. But I also see that there's I don't know what opportunities my audience has. I don't know what opportunities they can bring. Maybe they're in the system and they have an opportunity to do something to, to bring policy changes that could steer the system in a different direction. That's one of the things I wrote about in, in my book is like, let's, let's use the levers of, of the institutions to, to, for the people who have that opportunity and, and do something with it. And there's ways that we can sort of start to apply pressure that pressure in the sense of once there's an opening then something can happen differently than it was before. And that's the nature of human systems. They change. They're complex and they're adaptive. <laughs> and so it may look like starting new schools. It may look like changing schools that already exist. It may look like using charters or private school, whatever, whatever opportunity they have. And this is a very, you know, I've, I've been interviewing people from around the world. So that might be different in different countries. It might be different in different states. It might be different in one school versus another. So, so, so that's the, the agenda is not, you need to be different. The agenda is if you want different things, here's some ways to, you know, here, here's some people like Jerry <laughs> who are doing something different or ha and, and do it. And every conversation is different <laughs> because it is unique. You're a unique person. You did it your way. But you did it in community. You did it with a perspective on from Rhea Nisar. I, uh, uh, Daniel Quinn's, Ishmael. I think what his books were called. Yeah, yeah Ishmael. Yeah. That was an influencer series for me. Uh, expanding on that was uh, my friend Sharif Abdullah, who wrote Creating a World That Works for All. Mm -hmm. So he took it in another direction. There's David Corten, who's uh, one of the founders of Yes Magazine. Chellis Glendinning. I mean, there's there's a lot of people who've kind of been pointing out how our culture has deep roots in a certain way of being that is not working for most of the humans in it. Mm -hmm. But we also know that in our deeper past, there was a different relationship and a different way of being pointing to those partnership cultures, to put it in uh, exactly. Daniel Quinn's well, terms, it's levers. A, different, <laughs> a totally <laughs> different way of being and living and and exactly. yet we all know it in our hearts because I'm telling you, I have asked thousands of people over, gosh, probably 30 years, like from the early mm -hmm. 90s. Yep. I've been yep. doing talks and, and, and everyone knows it in their heart. 
and yet because, in my opinion, they are schooled, which right. <laughs> comes with a very deep belief system, they can't act on it for the most part. Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. if they act on it for themselves, they don't act on it for their children. Mm. Yeah, and that's a big challenge. That's sad. Yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> um, I think we're going to wrap up. We're hitting the hour mark here. Um, and I want to begin where we ended, or end where we began. That's what it is. <laughs> with a story. So tell me a story about a time that the school or an individual within the school faced a challenge and then through facing that challenge became better. The school might have been well, better or the person was better. I have a great, this is, this is young people feeling their power and their voice. Mm. So we're in about year two or three of this school and two of our, one middle school, like probably the girls were maybe their names are Izzy and Luna. They were probably like seventh and ninth grade. No, maybe even sixth and eighth grade. And they overhear a parent just outside the main room trying to force her young daughter, who's maybe five or six, mm -hmm. to put an issue on the school meeting board to discuss parents attending school meeting. Ah. <laughs> and the child is saying, no, we don't want parents. No, I'm not putting that up. And the parent <laughs> forced her daughter wow. to put it on the board. Well, these two girls heard that and they were like irate, but they handled it in a way I personally never would have even thought of. Mm. They go over to the art area we had this big, uh, you know, the poster board paper, we had it in yellow, as well as we had lots of yellow construction paper. And they cut out starburst things, like over three days, probably a 100 of them, all sizes, mm. poster board and construction paper, all these yellow starburst things. And on it, they wrote kid power. Mm. And they ran a kid power campaign. And it was around the time when the Sudbury schools were doing away with the assembly and giving the power to school meeting and the board. Hmm. And they sort of combined the two. We ended up having a big assembly meeting, which was parents, staff and students. Hmm. And they got, except for this woman and her friend, 100% of the parent vote because they put it on cars. They, they wore stickers that said kid power. They pasted it all over school. Everything said kid power. And all of the parents voted to disband the assembly, take mm. the parents out of it, and let most of the decisions of the school be made by the kids in school meeting. And mm. From that day forward, school meeting has totally run our school and mm. they have done an incredible job because they understood that they got the power and they took the responsibility. Nice, nice. And it's been great. Right on. My job's so, so easy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> and that's what I wish for parents, if they would truly get how much kids are capable of educating themselves, of making choices for their own life that are good and healthy. And they only right. react when they're in terrible environments. When they're in healthy environments, they make 98% the right decision all the time. Right. And it's right. like just amazing. And and really beautiful to watch. Right, right. And, that's, and that's on where top the... of that, most of them go to college with nothing we thought they needed. Right, right. But we don't right, push it right. at all. A few mm -hmm, of them start mm -hmm. their own business and go to college or one or the other. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's where that's where the, the community is the guardrails for the community, <laughs> you know, um, is, is yeah. that the the whole point is individually if you were to isolate someone they become incompetent and quite actually ill uh mentally uh because isolation is the problem 
relatedness is the is the context in which we have well-being and health uh, particularly mental health and yes. so and so it's it's the cohesiveness of this community yeah. that allows uh, i mean in educational terms they talk about scaffolding well kids scaffold each other because mm -hmm. because they have that they draw on their collective wisdom yes it doesn't matter that there's four-year-olds yes four-year-olds are generally incompetent at a lot of things but the point is they're not just four-year-olds they are a whole range of ages all the way up to young adults and real adults you know yes. chronological adults and legal adults and so that's the that's what people often don't immediately realize is how embedded that is how how embedded even the four-year-old is and that the four-year-old having a vote in the running of the school is not a hazard because it's a community making that decision together, not a four-year-old making that decision. And that's a hard thing for people to wrap their minds around, it seems like. But it's a group of people all being interconnected, having that access to their inner wisdom and sharing it in community that the four-year-old is hearing, whether it's in school that's meeting right. or in the middle of a game where somebody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did something a little bit off in terms of respect in a game and there's a conversation about it because right. that's important because our major rules are safety and respect they're in the mm -hmm. middle of a mm -hmm. soccer game and you know and it's dealt with right then and there right right and the yeah. four-year-olds they're all ears all the time to what the other yeah. kids are doing it yeah. really yeah. is true very cool all right well let's Let's call it good. Jerry Quirk, thank you so much for, for being with us. Um, I so appreciate it. Oh, if people want to find out more about Jersey Shore Free School, um, tell us how to find out about it. They may e email us at the Jersey Shore Free School, Jersey Shore Free School at yahoo.com. Mm. Uh, our phone number is 732-842-0238. If anybody wants a copy of Jamie's paper to really get a sense of how this works, either because they're interested for their children or hopefully because they want to start a Sudbury school in their area. By the way, mm -hmm. I offer free help to anyone who wants to start a Sudbury school. I'll give you a lot of the paperwork. I'll be your support person because I just believe in this so strongly. So please contact me if you want any further information. and. My personal email is drjerrycork at msn.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thanks, Don. And... It's a pleasure to meet you. All right. Take care. This has been the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I would love to hear from you. Please share what resonates with you from this episode. What do you think about schools that support children to exercise their agency on a daily basis? Agentic schools operate from within a new education paradigm. I wrote the Agentic Schools Manifesto to help you make sense of that new paradigm. The manifesto is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more. This vodcast is a co-production of Attituder Media and Deeper Learning Advocates. At Deeper Learning Advocates, we seek to embed the psychology of learning in policy so that policy stops undermining learning. The financial support of our audience is crucial to accomplishing that mission. You can find out more about the manifesto and join the cause at dladvocates.org. One final thing, I also offer a free course called Motivation Myth Busting for School Teachers. To sign up, visit holisticequity.org. Go to the Tools tab and click on Free Motivation Course. Thank you for your kind attention.